Welcome to the campus at Ball State University here in Muncie, Indiana for the Music for All Summer Symposium presented by Yamaha. I'm James Stevens, Director of Advocacy and Educational Resources for Music for All. At Music for All, our mission is to create, provide, and expand positively life-changing experiences through Music for All. It's our vision to be a catalyst to ensure that every child across America has access and opportunity to be engaged in active music making in his or her scholastic environment. Today's Urban Advisory Forum is made possible through generous support from the Country Music Association Foundation. Today's panel is made up of Music for All's Urban Advisory Team. From Louisiana, Director of Bands at Baker High School and Director of Education and Development for the Dev Music Company, William Irwin. <laughs> Assistant Professor of Music at William Carey University in Mississippi, Zachary Harris. <laughs> Director of Bands at Willow Ridge High School in Houston, Texas, Sybil James. Executive Director of Visual and Performing Arts of Dallas Independent School District, Tim Lindley. <laughs> and Chief Executive Officer for the Dev Music Company and member of the Board of Directors for Music for All, Ayate Shabazz. Zachary, I'd like to start with you today. I've, I've heard you earlier this week talking about being a successful music educator is uh, about being a team player, and it's more than just what happens in the band room, in the orchestra room, in the choir room. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about the, the team player philosophy in which you have? It, yes, um, having taught 31 years in uh, public education, um, there, there were four areas that I tried to connect with to make sure that that I showed them that I was not, it was not just about band, but it was about the total team. It was the administrators, the uh, parents, the, the other teachers that is in the, in the building, and, and last but not least certainly is uh, the students. And so with the administrators, I, I would always make sure that, um, that I would communicate with them on, on things to, to show them that I wanted to be a part of a team. When we had faculty meetings, I sat at the front of the, in front of the audience because I wanted to make sure that they see that I was, that I, I'm supporting of all the conversations that they're having. I would uh, follow uh, and, and go to the cafeteria and talk to them during the lunchtime. They, they're monitoring their lunch. I would just go and talk to them about general things, not about band, but about just general things. Ask them how their day was going. Um, and just talk to them about those type things. I, I tried to avoid not talking to them a whole lot about band, about especially about the needs that I wanted or the things that I thought that the band program should have, but more so about just the things that my students were doing positively that would, would reflect with the whole school, not just the band program. So anytime my students achieved um, uh, first chair placement at, at district or all state or things like that, I would, I would send out a little email to them, but I made sure that they were representing the school, not just the band program. So I always talk to them about the positive things. Uh, I avoided going and, and, and sitting down in the office with them, talking to them about what I needed because it got to the point where they see you coming, they will go the other direction. Uh, they only wanted to hear about the positive things, and I would talk to them about how the arts, not just band, but the arts in the schools, how it helps the students to develop them to be better citizens throughout the community and throughout life. Uh, with, the, with the parents, I always would actively involve them in any of the decisions that we made for the band program. I didn't necessarily go by necessarily go by the decisions that they suggested, but I would always allow them to have input. When we got ready to do fundraisers, I would ask them to submit to me fundraiser ideas because they are the ones that live out in the community 
and talking to the other people in the community, they know what sells, what, what is going to be successful. I tried, not to, I tried to avoid having fundraisers that were going to affect or hurt maybe some of the other businesses in the community because those are your band parents. You know, if you, if you teach in that district or in that community long enough, you're going to have all forms of students come through the band program. And so I would allow them to make suggestions because they would know. And then the executive board of the booster organization, we would discuss those fundraisers. Uh, we avoided any band fees that were going to that that were going to directly, you know, hurt the hurt the parents or hurt the community. So everything that we did, all of our fundraisers, um, it was to it was to help with the students, not with equipment. It was to pur purchase uh, band t their uh, band t-shirts, their, their shoes, anything that they needed to be in the part of the band program. I never use um, uh, funds and fees from the booster organization to buy equipment. That was the district's responsibility. Um, and then the, th the third one was the teachers. I would, I would avoid at all possible holding the students over late for them to go to their next class because I always wanted to show the teachers that I was a team player and I didn't think band was more important. So I made a point of, cl of closing down my rehearsals and my class a little early so the students would have enough time to get there. I would uh, always send out positive things to the teachers. I would ask them to, uh, if there was anything that they needed me to uh, help with. Um, I would uh, open my band room up for those um, organizations, those AP testing, to where they needed a large facility to, to have the testing, I would offer that to the counselors. I would make sure with my counselors that I would go and make my schedules early to where it wouldn't put a lot of pressure on them to, uh, to have to schedule ban at, at the last minute. So I would, I would have all of those schedules that are exactly how I wanted them um, to them early. And then I would go and ask them if they needed help with, with trying to schedule them. I would make sure that the head counselor, once a week, I would take her a Diet Coke. That was her favorite soft drink. Mm -hmm. And I also made sure that all of my counselors and administrators got a band t-shirt because I wanted them to feel like they were part of the team also. And last but not least was the students. I would, I would, we would talk about when it was time for the, for do the big trip, the spring trip, every other year, we would talk to them and ask them for suggestions on how, uh, where they wanted to go and what type of festival they wanted to participate in. We would have a, um, an executive band council where I would bring them in and we would, we would just sit down and talk about life, not about band, but about life, life experiences. How is band benefiting you that's going to help you later on in life? And we would, I would ask them to share that with their section members and things like that because it is so important. You'll be surprised at how much we teach is going to help them to be successful in life. And so I made sure that the students had a, a, a very important role in it. It wasn't about just me and it wasn't about just band, it was about the whole team setting that we tried to develop in my band program. And out of the 31 years, I never had a bad administrator. Never, and 31 years of teaching, never had it. And the reason was, was because I showed them that I was part of a team. I made sure that they, they, if they needed something, I would do everything I could to be a part of that, to show it. I think it's interesting, uh, Zach, we've been talking about a collaboration a lot uh, this, this, during the process of the I-65 Corridor uh, Summit, and it's being a team player uh, from the standpoint of being a music educator can also bring some uh, camaraderie throughout your school building. Uh, being a team player using those four facets that he just talked about can go so much further. Even uh, in my experiences at, at all three areas where I've taught, making yourself available to the master scheduling team, 
making yourself avail available to uh, chaperone certain school activities or be on the student activity team, yes, your organization will probably play for a pet rally. But if you're organizing the pet rally and, you, and you're able also, that turns into a recruitment factor as well. We'll get to that a little later. But you want to be visible to more than just your students. You want your students to be visible to their colleagues in a point where you're making them team players throughout the building. So if you're leading by example, team player, it just grows. It's almost infectious. It, it's, it's a positive, positive thing that's growing throughout the building that builds collaboration not only from a social network, but from a, an academic network as well. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of heads nod. Uh, so what I, what's really interesting and, and is really special, I think, is that we're talking about the music classroom being the place in which civics and citizenship is being taught, right? Uh, Tim, question for you, or at least I know you have used the terminology playing the long game. And as, a, as an arts administrator, um, how is it that you uh, take your team and plan the longevity of a full program? Sure. Um, well, you know, I think it dovetails perfectly into what Zach was talking about. Um, you know, when I talk to my, my teachers uh, and, and myself when I was a band director previously, it really comes down to this question. So. If you sit down right now and you think about, okay, I'm going to describe in five years what I want my program to look like. And I'm going to describe it um, in every way that's important to me. And you'll find, interestingly enough, the things you, you kind of zero in on will tell you where your priorities are. Um, so I know for me, when I was a band director, um, I'd be thinking about attendance. You know, I'm, going to have, I'm not going to have kids leaving for, for tutorials every single morning for my marching band rehearsal and I'm gonna have 390 kids in the band and I'm gonna make sure that we've got professional level instruments for everybody who uh, needs it and uh, we're gonna make sure we have everybody in private lessons and we're gonna have an engaged parent base and I'd kind of write all this down. So you end up with that, that kind of final project in your mind. This is what it needs to look like. And then backwards planning, okay, great. Well, then what do we need to look like in three years and what do we need to look like in one year? And once you get to that one year point, it really starts to lock in for you, okay, what are the immediate steps that I need to take? And then once you've done that, you start realizing, okay, so now we're gonna tell our story. What do we have to, to describe to make what we're talking about actually happen? And understand this, and this kind of goes to PR, but other, other people can tell your story and you have no idea what they're gonna say. Uh, you got those parents that you hope talk to other parents, and then you got those parents that you don't hope talk to other parents. Um, we all know who those are. We can probably, you know, list them off right now. But if you're in control of your story, well, that's how you get, that's one of the most important ways to get from A to B. Um, and the other thing is, whether it's you or your assistant band directors or your kids or your drum major or your parents, the more you can get everybody to align to that message. I always, I talk to my staff in, in Dallas, we always say everything needs to be on message. And on message means in alignment with our goals. If we, know, if we know that in five years we want to increase our overall board funding so that I can buy more instruments for all of our programs, then every word that comes out of my mouth to an important stakeholder in the next five years needs to go toward that goal. And it's really the same concept when you're in the teaching role as well. Um, the other thing is when you're trying to decide making your schedule, you really want to focus in on activities, again, that specifically get you closer to the goal. And what I think we are talking about a moment ago was a perfect example of that. So if your goal is to make it so that the master scheduler who rules your life and makes sure that your kids get in the wrong classes and now you can't take them to contest because you got five oboes in the top band, um, what are you going to do? Well, if you decide to stop at Sonic and buy that person a Diet Coke on a daily basis, that's a utilization of time which will have a substantial payoff in the future. So again, if you're thinking about how you're using your time in the furtherance of those goals, and don't invest energy in things that don't get you closer to those goals. We all know that we have 100 million things to do, and we're band directors, so 13 hours of work on a slow day to get it done. Um, you're going to have to prioritize your time around that. Um, you want to sculpt others' inter interactions with your program. So, for example, you know the principal's coming to a concert. Now, you never know what concert it's going to be because they told you 500 times that you're going to be able, that they're going to come and whatever, but they might come, right? 
And so you're going to make sure you got a parent at the door to wait and bring them in and they're going to have a seat right there around the rest of the parents and you make sure that the parents that they're sitting around are the ones you want them to sit around. You sculpt their environment and you sculpt their interaction with you so that the next time at the budget meeting a year from now, they're sitting down and going, boy, I got an extra $5,000. What should I do? I sure do like that band program. I don't quite know why I can't put my finger on it, but boy, that's a bunch of great people. Engaged parent base too. I'll give them 5,000 extra bucks. I swear that's how it works. And so the more you kind of facilitate those, uh, those interactions, the better. I'd be interested in hearing from y'all um, if, if there's someone who wants to, to uh, offer up their goals for dissection. You know, when you think about what you want your program to look like in five years, what would, what, how would you describe that? Is there anyone who's willing to share? It doesn't have to be a dissertation on the future history of so-and-so high school band program. It could just be, I want, I want parents to get their kids to rehearsals. That's, that's an important thing for me five years from now. Oh, so one of our goals right now is actually just making sure that all the students have instruments in their hands. So in five years, it'd be awesome if not only that we had instruments that were adequate to use you know, at school, but also ones for like the bigger instruments, like tubas, that they had them for home practice as well. So that's kind of a goal that I've got at least right now. So what what steps are you taking right now in the micro to kind of get closer to that? Well, that's actually something we were talking about during the um, I-65 summit uh, when we collaborated with our students. And our students said, you know, one thing that we could do, we could go to our church and just ask if anybody has any in their in their closets they're not using and start kind of branching out to community and asking for donations. We haven't done that before. And so that was a that was a great little thing that we we're like, okay, we're gonna start this, we're gonna try this. And then other things like even just having maybe a car wash and with a goal in mind of hopefully being able to obtain one of the instruments that we're in dire need of. Sure. So those um, kinds of things. And I, I mean that's a perfect example of taking it back to that first step. Um, because I think one of the great things about that is you got the kids involved and that they're engaged in it and they know it's a challenge. It's going to get the message out to the community. And then eventually when you look at your three, your four, your five year goal, you start looking at sustainability. So how can we every five years host an instrument drive? Obviously every one year people only have so many clarinets in their closet. But if it's an ongoing thing and they, they associate your program with the place, oh, I'm going to hold on to this trumpet that you know, Johnny gave me because I know there's going to be a band drive in a few years. Um, kind of working towards sustainability. I think that's a great example, and it's one that I know we all face, is how do we have enough instruments in the hands of our kids and quality instruments at that. So thank you for sharing. Thank you. Anybody else? So Tim's talking about uh, goal planning and, and strategic planning. What other experiences or, or uh, you know, thoughts can you share on that? Yeah. Uh, a goal for I have for my program is for them to be able to take a band trip. Uh, at least once a year or maybe every two years. Uh, I kind of feel like once I get into the planning, it just becomes daunting to parents and to students of the financial aspects of it and also preparing the music to um, be uh, good enough to go to one of these festivals and actually perform well and not um, uh, have intonation issues or something like that. Sure. Um, I guess my question for you is, what are some steps that you do to uh, plan a trip and how do you uh, communicate that to the parents and get the parents on board too? That's a great question and, and it's one that um, from a uh, from a ground level as far as actually working with the parents and doing the planning on a trip I guarantee there are people better uh, qualified to answer the question than me but I'll talk to you about it from a political district level um, and, and a, just some follow-up questions. Do you feel like the greatest thing holding you back from being able to take the trip is monetary or is it, um, is it district support to allow you to go? Um, do you think the district would let you go if money wasn't a problem? Or do you think even if you lined up the money, the district doesn't want you to go because uh, they don't want you to miss school? No, um, I don't think it's a district issue. I think it's more of a monetary issue. Okay. Um, and then the other question is, is it a requirement for the district or for your school that you participate in a competitive event uh, if you take the kids out? Uh, no, it's not. So one of the things I'd recommend doing, obviously, uh, and again, I'll, I'll see this in just a moment to someone else, but if you can build that longevity and you can build sustainability into your, into your deal. So if they know, okay, we went on a trip, um, we had huge publicity, we didn't go to a concert or a contest because uh, if you don't think for intonation reasons or whatever, that's going to be a successful thing for the kids out of the gate, then maybe they're having a performance at, uh, and one of the things I like to do is we go down to Corpus Christi in Texas and play a concert at the Lexington. 
um, which is a battleship. The kids thought it was the coolest thing ever. The acoustics were terrible, so no one could hear how we sounded really, uh, which is helpful in the late spring. And um, it was a positive experience for the kids. And we'd get pictures and the mayor would be there and all this kind of stuff. And then we'd bring it out and, and, and PR it. So that's one thing I'd recommend doing. And then eventually you can make it a competitive thing. On the monetary standpoint, it may be, in our district for instance, we just had um, a school that took their kids to Disney. It was a three year plan. So, and it, was, it took a lot to get the community on board with understanding the kids you're investing in today may not even get to go. Um, but they got to do it. And you know what spurred that off was the time before they went and marched in a parade in Washington. Again, non-competitive, but very out there. There was a clear educational bent. The social studies department loved that they were going to all the museums. Um, so you kind of got the district behind it. And, um, and because it was the first time this school had gone on a trip in a long time, they were able to get a lot of community support. So those are some of the things I'd recommend just kind of from an overall political level to think about. Uh, but from a trip planning perspective, does anyone have something they want to add in? I think from a from a standpoint, uh, um, Lorenzo, I think we have similar school program school programs. We're in the same geographical area. Um, when you're dealing with trips, which are important to our students, they get in our organizations to travel. Let's let's just be honest. Starting small, like uh, Tim said, is very important. Sometimes you might just need to go to Blue Bayou and do a concert in the park, right there in Baton Rouge, and that's going to actually get the kids excited and as as your stakeholders start to see that you're taking the time to get your kids to to perform in places outside of the band hall the, the auditorium or even the stadium at your school they're going to start to automatically invest in the program it's part of, it goes all the way back to being a team player when you start to establish your relationship throughout the community you know if you're taking your uniforms to be clean somewhere if, that's in the community. If you're getting your pregame meals from somewhere that's in the community, when it's time for your students to perform outside of the community, your very same community is going to support that. You know, taking then when, when you start, decide to take the big trip, it's not going to be so hard to get the monies up because they feel like they are part of the program and so they want to be successful as well because this is our band. It's we, it's us, it's our. It, it, is not, it, it no longer becomes, it's them. Okay, so you, you make them a part. Team player is it goes much more you know, than, than you think. One of the things that I did to help out with, with that when it came to the, the monetary thing, uh, we, we tried to get, the, as uh, William said, we tried to get businesses and stuff like that to kind of help out. And so what, what we did was anything that the, the band did on Friday nights, even at a ball game, we would take pictures and we would submit it to the, to the local newspaper. We, uh, anything we would talk up, we would, we would allow the the small ensembles to go to some of the, the, the different uh, social clubs that they have, uh, the Kiwanis Club, the different things like that, and just perform uh, for them so they can kind of see how, you know, what these students are doing and things like that. And that way you can go to them later on and you can say, hey, we've been invited to come and perform at the Cherry Blossom Parade uh, and stuff like that. Is it any way that you can kind of help us to, to, you know, pay for some of the expenses because all the students can't afford to do it? And then, you, we, once again, you, you have to sell your program to your parents. The parents are going to be the ones that's out there in the community, you know, talking to the neighbors about my child is, is you know, first chair in the all-state band or the district band and things like that and what band has done for, for my child. You know, we, we all have experience when it, when a student comes in your classroom, they're real quiet and shy, and they won't hardly talk. And by the end of that school year, they, they've got so many friends, and it's because of band, and all of those band students are similar, right. you know, and stuff like that. And so uh, we, would, we would just, we would showcase our program as much as possible in the community. And then we would, we would start asking, <laughs> you know. And, and, and I would pick fundraisers, I'm sorry, I would pick fundraisers that would benefit the community and the businesses. Like we did, we did a coupon book. And so the, and with that coupon book, the, the, the company would come, by, come through and they would go to the different businesses and get them to give, them, give us type of coupons and stuff like that. And we would sell that book as a, as a fundraiser. And so once again, you got the community involved, you got the businesses involved, and it's an opportunity for the students and the, and the parents to, to raise money to kind of help pay for those, those trips. 
Uh, this is kind of how about with the fundraising aspect of trips. Um, this past December, my group was invited to participate in the Parade of Heroes in D.C. So that was a, that came out to about five hundred dollars a kid. So that had some I have a wide social economic mix. So there were some parents that could write the check that night, and then there were some that just flat out said, "Well, my kid's not going." And if we're going to play, I had about 35, 38. So two trumpets said they can't go. That's the whole trumpet section. So I'm like, I need everybody to go. Um, and to do fundraisers gets really exhausting. Um, so I had to get creative with doing fundraisers that didn't cost anything up front. So I held a ensemble concert and charged admission at one of the local churches. So everybody played. Woodwinds did something, brass did something, percussion didn't get it together. But at the end, <laughs> <laughs> I had everyone play like our MPA pieces. So everyone still performed. I even performed on, on tube and piano. So you know they saw me perform. That, that was a whole nother dynamic. Um, we held a walkathon. So that doesn't cost anything. It's just publicity and get people to do donations so that the kids will walk around. Um, just like a little. Large circles, about a mile and a half around that circle. Um, something else, uh, something other than just the usual car washes, because we were in school. We, I'm I'm tired of doing car washes. So <laughs> <laughs> but some parents like we want to do car. Okay, if you want to do it, go right on ahead. I'll watch. I'll supervise. I'll, I'll watch my my share. But um, just try to think outside the box. Um, to keep from selling candy that you have to pay for and then it, won't, it doesn't get all sold or someone, someone eats one out the box for a, a month and then they're all gone and you got to get that $30 from them and they don't have it to give and that's the whole issue. But just trying to find other fundraisers that don't have to cost you money where everything is a profit. And to piggyback off that real quick, you, you said something that just sparked my mind and I think is really worth, worth bringing up and I bet everyone else heard it too. Um, a $500 parade trip may or may not be the right call for your program at that moment. When I, when I think about that, I think, okay, for example, when I started teaching, I had the fourth band at a school, a um, bunch of beautiful, cute, wonderful freshmen who would you know, walk into a door if it wasn't open for them. They, were, they weren't the brightest bulbs in the box, but we got it done. I, my favorite piece in the world is the Hindemith Symphony. I love it. It's on the grade five list. Um, I had no business playing a grade five with that group of kids. Over time, over a five-year plan, maybe we get there. But we're going to start with grade one, then we're going to start with grade two, then we're going to work our way up. That five-year plan we talk about, your trip may need to be a grade one trip. You know, an overnight to a place 30 minutes away where you are ambassadors for your school district or ambassadors for your city and that other city, and you play a concert, and maybe you get the theater involved, and and then the next year it's 60 miles away and it costs another $10 and you slowly but surely built up your bandwidth for your community to be able to handle these things and appreciate them. And then five years, you're ready for that grade five trip. Um, and the good news is the sooner you get ready for that, when those kind of invitations come through, you're going, we can handle this. And your parents are also like, yeah, we can come up with a solution for it. Um, so I would think of scaling your trip opportunities and your financial obligations the same way you scale your literature. Okay, uh, I'm from Louisiana, and I have a middle school band. We travel out of state every year, and um, what I do, I have uh, different fundraisers. Uh, we march parades. Also, I have an ad booklet I do for the Christmas concert, and I do for the spring concert, and we might have a, a, a night of elegance where the kids uh, dress up, and they come, like if it's a prom or something, and they come and uh, we charge for the tickets to come in. We have an ad book of it. Uh, the person who bring in the most ads, and that's involving the community. You're advertising their company in that little ad book. You can, you can have a one concert for, you know, five songs on a concert or whatever, but you have pages of advertising the companies in the neighborhood, and uh, we've traveled from Atlanta to to Florida, Dallas. We've been everywhere. Uh, also, uh, we was invited to Washington D.C. Uh, two years ago, and it was six hundred dollars a kid. And uh, the summer prior to that, I had uh, 
a summer band camp for free. And I offered it to anybody in the neighborhood because we had a free uh, breakfast program and a free lunch. So I said, free band practice, free lunch, free breakfast. And they thought, oh, wow. You know, and I just, I had two little kids that came and uh, participated. They wasn't in the school. But, you know, they, they was in the neighborhood and they participated. And the dad was so happy that when we uh, had to go to Washington, D.C., he went to the news. He went everywhere. He set up a church performance for us and everything. And we that trip was almost $80,000 for 70 70 kids to go and perform for the veterans and we toured the museums and everything and it was just me taking time out with their children during the summer offering teaching them music and uh also i wanted to tell you that um donors choose i don't know if you heard of them but uh i've had donors choose give me drums, cymbals. They had a keyboard set with the 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 stereo uh, speakers to go with it. The chair, the whole thing. Uh, uh, right now, I'm about to get the the electric saxophone and finale software. You know, donors choose has helped me so much. My kids are ninety percent. Uh, what you call that? Uh, free, and free and reduced lunch, and you know, so we. I have to do everything to raise money for to get my kids to go anywhere. Uh, when I was in school in New Orleans, we didn't have much, and I know what it's like for kids to not have. And uh, we march around the neighborhood. People come to me all the time. Hey, look, I got an instrument in my closet I don't care what it look like I take it whether we can fix it or not I take it and they just keep coming they bring us instruments and and let us you know and we just involve anytime they ask us to play for their church picnic or whatever we're there and so they see us in a community and that's what helps out uh people donating for us and you know uh they had a newspaper for the uh, neighborhood, my kids pass out the flyers for their, uh, you know, meetings that the neighborhood would have. So we get involved with them. So, you know, that that's what helped. And um, I am in your district and, uh, you know, we travel everywhere, everywhere we want to go, everywhere. We, in music festivals, uh, and I, you know, if it's a year when I know that we can't get too much money, you know, we go somewhere closer, you know. And just like uh, they had a, a slow year one time with one school I was at, we just went to New Orleans. They had jazz land, and it, they have a music festival. And they have music festivals that do not compete, but they allow you to participate and perform, like you were saying, you know, so we did all that, whatever it takes to get them involved. The kids like to go places. You know, even if you're playing, you know, downtown at the riverfront, you know, for uh, Fourth of July or something, the Christmas, go to the mall and play, you know, and put a sign up and let people know. You know, Walmart doubles, you know, sells, uh, you know, dinners and uh, at Walmart, it matches the funds. If you make 500, they give you a thousand. You know, they match, you know, the funds that you have. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a hustler because, you know, I try, <laughs> <laughs> I try to get everything I need. Um, to uh, August 16, I had the flood. It was devastating. Uh, my school flooded, my house flooded because I stayed on the street. My church flooded, it was just, unbelievable but um they had someone from virginia called the school donated 50 instruments i don't know what you know it's just i just been blessed i just thank god for that <laughs> you know but i just want you know and i write grants you know so um walmart has a grant that you can write you uh, go online for that uh i do different kind of grants uh all state the different insurances have grants for educators you know for instruments just let them know what you need you know tell them uh 
what kind of kids you have that you can't, they can't afford the different things and just go into detail. They want detail. They want to really know that this kid need it. This kid need the instrument. We, you know, we, we had one, one read sharing 12 students, you know, just go, <laughs> just go into detail and express the need. And I'm telling you, it will pour. They will give it to you. Can I just say, uh, this, is, this, this young lady, first, first of all, I'm from Louisiana, and she sounds like my family is so great. <laughs> we talked talk last night. But, but because she has done all of these things, the, the, the gap between the community and, and the school, that has blessed her program more and more times. And as educators, a lot of time, we get caught up in what we're required to do in our classrooms with our kids. I know some districts have required performances and you have to do well at those performances and, and, and things. And we, we try to shave off things that, we, that, that uh, we should be doing because we're trying to just meet what we have to do. And you just can't do that, you know, because we all have a passion, passion for music and education. We have to remember that we have to continue to keep bridging that, bridging that gap because somebody saw her hustle to get the things that she had when she lost it all. That's when those blessings started co coming back. I know for me and, and my staff, they know that we work very hard for our students. And when we got in an adverse situation, we were blessed by our community and, and people who weren't in our community. They, they helped my students. So it's very important to continue to, to do that outreach all the, t all the time and let people see that you care. And when your students see that you care, your fellow teachers see that you, that you care, the businesses and everything, it's gonna come right back, right back to you and it's gonna make that experience better for your students. It's, it's my belief that, uh, that if you maintain the understanding that everything you do is student-centered, mm -hmm. everything else falls into place. Yeah, so whether it be monetary, whether it be support physically, whether it be support emotionally for your students from different facets of life, as long as you do everything student-centered, right. everything's going to work out. And per, our, per our, um, earlier sessions, when you were talking about being aggressive, and I don't think you're afraid of no. <laughs> so, I mean, if you're going to be out on the front lines of your kids, you got to take all the hits, you know, the good ones and the bad ones. And, and when you're able to do that or willing to do that without any fear, it is going to come to you. And that's why you are so blessed, because you're doing blessful things. You're blessing those kids not only with a great musical education, but show them what heart means, what caring means and what doing will get you so yeah and just to piggyback on what everyone else said um your question about traveling we tend to travel in the in my band program as well and something that the the parents really appreciate is time telling them in time so we're not going to tell them in august that we're taking a trip in november we're going to tell them the year before so if you do get to that grade five trip that he mentioned before um, a year and a half as much in advance. We tell our seventh graders, you know, we're going to take our big trip when you're in ninth grade, parents get ready. Um, or, you know, it, it, several months in advance and it gives you a chance to hustle more, <laughs> like she said, and to raise that money. So not do it quite so quickly. One thing, and, and I feel like we've, uh, I mean, you are the perfect example of taking every ounce of community and external support that there is um, and, and translating that into actionable work. I think that's amazing. Um, to pivot for a second though, to your internal stakeholders. And I think one of the reasons why we often will um, immediately look to the community to, to support our needs is because we're used to going to our principal or going to the school board or going to wherever and hearing no and so you go, all right, well, I'm going to go where they tell me yes. And that's where the community, because they value X, Y, Z. Um, and the reason I bring this up is, I will tell you, I think every, not every, most principals you ever deal with, most central administrators you ever deal with, got into this for the same reason you did. And somewhere underneath that suit and tie is a real living, beating heart that actually does care but is so used to getting asked things that they can't possibly provide 
that they just default to no. And here's why they default to no. Most of the time, they don't get to make the choice themselves. They got to pick up the phone and call someone, assistant superintendent to this and that, and ask for more money, and they get told no. So how do you arm your principal, or arm your, your if you have a central person that, that helps over fine arts, how do you arm that person so that they can go fight for you and maybe they're not gonna get told no? It's the power of data. So this is one of the things that I think us as band directors, we often forget. And it's not just band, it's anything in the fine arts. For instance, in Texas, and I think this is pretty much the same everywhere, the more kids you have in class, the more money the school district gets. The, you could say it's correlation, but I think it's causation, that our kids come to school, yeah. okay? And we make master scheduling easy. And now you talk to your master scheduler, they're gonna go, well, wait a minute, you said you have to have, you know, all saxophones on a C-star mouthpiece that are playing uh, this with the last name of M through Z in first period and the Z through F kids are gonna be in second period. If you're that person, you're shooting yourself in the foot. But when it comes to the principal's mindset, they have a room where they can put 70 kids at once if they need to. That's awesome because pre-AP brain surgery can only hold you know, 15 kids and they gotta schedule everything around it. There's so many things that we do that make the business of a school run better. So when you can show your enrollment statistics and your percentage of student retention and student increase and what that trans find out in your, in your area what the school gets paid for those kids coming to school and show how you are making the district money. Show, if you can, and you can get access to the test scores, or you can get access to, or, or just you know, uh, comments from their teachers about how they are in class. All these things that you can do in empirical data that you can put on a chart and hand to your principal and go, let me show you what our program's doing for the school. Um, now I want, Mr. Principal or Ms. Principal, for you to go back and look per capita, what are you spending on us versus athletics? Or what are you spending on us versus pre-AP brain surgery? And I want you to see if the value we're pro providing equals the investment you're giving. And then we're gonna talk about that next week. And then once you get that data and you disaggregate that data, then you start to distribute it, then you're talking about, you're building from the ground up your, your, your advocacy. You're building up the people that are gonna advocate for you beyond your building. Because once you get the teachers involved, once you get the counselors involved and the other administrators in the building, and you already got the students and parents, then the community again becomes involved in what's going on. They're going to speak out for you, okay? Advocacy, that's our, that's our biggest weapon. Once we get those people that understand what we do, then it becomes easier for us to explain the difference between education and entertainment, okay? They're used to us entertaining. Halloween concerts, football games, parades, Mardi Gras, they're used to us entertaining. But once we educate our stakeholders about the importance of music education and its, in, its, you know, and its effect on the whole student, on their mindset, on how we affect them affectively, then, then you understand that, okay, we got more here than just a, a, a marching band. We got more here than just a show choir. We got more than just a jazz quartet. We have uh, future lawyers, doctors, businessmen that are gonna, gonna they're developing that whole, in, that whole person that's gonna be that great citizen later on in life that's gonna come back and make those decisions about fine arts education later on. So it's, it's a whole cycle. So we wanna make sure that we're educating all of our stakeholders about what's most important. Mm -hmm. And that's, uh, that's touching our students both with the academics, athletics, and the arts. The real AAA. Yeah, we, we uh, one of the things that I would do is, is we would, um, at our annual band banquet, we would uh, announce, uh, first of all, I would invite the administrators to come to the banquet. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have just invite them, I would go and give them a, a ticket and tell them what, what day it was gonna be. And I would, go, I would go, you know, weeks in advance so they can go ahead and schedule it. Even the superintendent uh, would, would attend. And we would, we would give out scholastic awards at our banquet. Those students that made the honor roll the first three, nine weeks, we would, we would showcase that. We would announce that every graduating senior in our band has been offered a scholarship to go on to college because uh, all the community colleges will, will, uh, will give out uh, as, many, as many scholarship offers as you have uh, seniors. Right. And, and then we would also uh, announce the average ACT score um, of our graduating seniors as well as, um, as, well as the, the, the total 
senior. As far as data, you're exactly right. We would, we would always talk about how many, how many of our students are coming to school every day. We, don't, we have a very low attendance problem uh, in, our, in our school, in our band program, because um, we, it was something that they, they felt like they, they had a little ownership in. The students feel like they have a little ownership. They come to the band hall before school, and they come to the band hall after school. And even if you don't have after school rehearsals, they're hanging out in the band hall and stuff like that. And so we would, we would showcase all of those things. And so the year that we got, invi uh, or got accepted to come to Music for All to do the National Concert Festival, I went to my superintendent when I first got the invitation, and I talked to him about the finances of being able to bring a band from Mississippi to Indianapolis um, to perform. And so I had gone and done all the research. And we were the first band from Mississippi that had ever been invited to perform. Oh, I rode that hard. <laughs> I rode that. I went to the superintendent and told him we will be the first band to ever perform on a national stage, a concert festival uh, in Indianapolis. And by the time we got through, he put the first $50,000 into the account for the band to come. That instantly dropped the cost of the trip for the students in half. But it was because that in the top 10 of the graduating class, five of them are in band, you know? And, it, and it's because of what we teach every day. It's, we don't, we're not teaching them, you know, the other th we, we're just teaching them how to be successful. And through, we've been blessed through music to do it, you know? And so you use those tools that you have to get to that, to that point that you, that goal that you're trying to reach. And know? target the data to the audience. And, and we're gonna have a comment by this wonderful gentleman who's been waiting. Um, no, it's, it, but the one thing I wanted to say is, you know, we talked about being on message. So the superintendent needs to hear that the top five kids are, that, are, are in, in band and that will be the first from Mississippi, and this will be a big thing that'll make this, and he's thinking this will be a big thing that makes the school district great, and I'm in charge of the school district, so cool. The parents need to hear about the 100% scholarship rate. The administrator needs to hear about how much money you're making for the school in attendance. And when you have this compendium of data at your disposal, you can pick and choose how to be on message with each of those attendance recipients with the data that they need to hear. And I'll shut up and we'll hear from this awesome guy. Uh, one thing I did for my administration, um, as, as, as we, we teach in a lot of places that are, are athletic driven, a lot of, lot of trips to the national, the state championship game, all that kind of stuff. So they, they, they see what they see. They don't always understand the process of what comes behind. And so, you know, when people ask, you know, what about uniforms? And you get told from a superintendent, well, I don't buy uniforms, but I also don't buy them for the football team. So that's a whole nother explanation of what it is we're trying to raise. Um, so I, I think that even with administrators, just awareness of what it is we do and how it's done. Um, they're, they're big, they didn't know, understand that the uniforms were 14 years old. They just wondered why they always saw the same ones. I said, well, be, because this is, this is what they cost. And sharing that data as far as they could see the students who were the academic you know, spotlights. And so when you start doing, one thing we start doing a program within our program is we started doing uh, signings for people with band scholarships. Same thing we do for athletics. We would have, you know, Dr. You know, uh, Cynthia Turner from UGA come in and present the scholarship and uh, other, other Dr. Land come in and present scholarships to Young Harris. So that put the program out as far as what can happen. So when they ask, well, what do you need and what are some things to do, you're already ready. Sometimes when we wait to, to see what's asked, and we've been trying to ask and trying to get in the office, already have it ready. Well, this is, these are the list of priorities. We want to buy new uniforms. This is what we can do. I've talked to um, this company, and I've talked to this company, and do we need to bid it out? Things that, we, things that make their jobs a little easier, because all they're going to do is, is they're going to run up the chain as well. So uh, with my principal, he needed to understand that we, we want the band to be bigger within the class. We want class enrollment to go up and the FTE numbers to go up. But you can't wait till the students come to buy the instruments. So he didn't realize that there was no mu new music inventory. I've, I've directed bands for eight years. We bought little small little things and little instruments out of the closets and those things. But the, the your big instruments, we didn't purchase. 
and they just never had to purchase them. But so you can't really wait until the program grows to buy instruments. So a lot of it, they just don't know. And you got to get, get those times where you just show them different things. Well, hey, if when I came in, the, the Sousa phones didn't work very well, so we bought four. Well, you remember the year we had five? Well, I borrowed one. I would like to do six, but so we need two more. Oh, you talking about those big things? Uh, yeah, they're called Sousa phones. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, uh, the, the reason why we can't have more drummers or more battery or more this on the field because we only own this much equipment. Mm -hmm. Really? That's all we own? Yes, that's all we own. So now, you know, his, his big thing is to, to make sure we put instruments on the shelf to get rid of the, the, the rental process. And believe it or not, some students and parents that don't know, I had a 12th grader turn in his instrument and say, I, I need to turn this back into the music store. Why do you need to turn it back in? You've rented it since you were in fifth grade band. They don't know what they don't know. And so we, we have to inspect it and go, hey, well, you know what, I can, let's see, can we get you an instrument? Okay, because this is, you're, you're, you're wondering why you're getting certain tones and certain sounds. Well, they're, they're playing on the beginning instrument. So they, they, a lot of, and not only administrators, parents don't know. So in information settings, anytime you get a chance to, to involve parents in, in decision-making process, involve in the, the investment of what they're doing, and they will see the need. They saw, we got new uniforms, we got new, new jackets. So the bibbers, we're gonna do a different, oper, you know, a different process with bibbers, but the jackets are new, it'll be a new color. But they, they realize that this is a, a 10, an eight to 10 year investment. This is not something that you're doing, and they don't even know that. They, because sometimes they look at the athletics and they may get new, new jerseys or new whatever every two to three years. No, the band uniform stays with us longevity about eight to 10 years. Oh, so this, this $20,000 investment is gonna last. Yes, if we take care of them, okay. And then, and then also makes them feel a little bit better. So as much as you can educate them, just kind of pull the coattail every now and then and just, and just show them, show them the data, show them what's, here's the inventory, other than reeds and mouthpieces and, and mutes, what have we really bought for the program? And wind chimes that all the bars are there, you know? Uh, <laughs> what have we done? I mean, one thing, one thing to add to that, I'm sorry, is that one thing to add to that is the marriage of both of these comments about uh, data and, and curtailing your speech to the audience and educating. You only have but so long to do that. So you have to develop that elevator speech. You got to practice it. You got to know exactly, you got about a minute and a half. Yeah, you got, <laughs> you got about a minute and a half with whoever you're speaking with to let them know exactly what you need and how they can contact you to help you with it. And see, Marcus will never have a, he'll, have a, he'll never have a bad administrator because he's gonna train them and teach them. And that's what I meant by, the, out of the 31 years that I taught, I never had a bad administrator because they don't know, they really don't know. Only thing that they see is the Friday night performances. They don't know. I mean, they don't, they really don't even wanna come in your band hall and observe you because they don't know what to look for. You know, so you, you gonna you have to train them. You have to teach. Them. And then understand that that vision that 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 you have. You know, if you've been in 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 this for a while, you may have a different administrator when you start school this year, and you don't even know it yet. And you may have to pitch that bit that vision over and over again. But you got to keep doing it because that's what's going to drive your program. That's what's going to help you meet those those goals that he said that you needed to needed to set for your program. And you can't get tired of doing it. You see a new face in, in, in your administration at your school. You got to shake their hand. And you got to tell them what the what the vision is. Tell them about all the good things that that's happened. Tell them about your goals because you're not going to be able to meet that unless you keep introducing that to people you know and in uh, communities like like the one where I am there are people moving in and out of that that community all the time so your your program has got to be visible all the time you got to keep doing stuff in the community so that they can keep blessing your program like like uh, this young lady's program has been, has has been blessed and how all of your programs are being blessed right now change is is inevitable it's it's constant and you know when you have vision you just have to have to put it out there and, and give it to people. If you also have an instrument deficiency, especially for years, make it a sense of urgency, you know? Sometimes you have to fool them, especially if you're going to do a pep rally. 
take that tuba and put some duct tape around it where the prince and walk it past the principal so he could <laughs> see that. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's so much, so much passion in the room, which is exciting, right? It's an amazing thing. Um, one thing I wonder, and one thing I wondered in my division, I'm a fine arts coordinator as well in a space, is um, the band people get really passionate about the band, and, and, and it's amazing. And yet, I know there's also choir people really passionate about the choir, and drama people really passionate about the drama. And so we started really trying to be purposeful to educate um, the community so that the data tells one story, but then there's this also this awesome story that students and parents are, are showing when we create the opportunities for them to perform together. Uh, when we tear down the silos and start to have that be one community, so it's not choir and band and orchestra, it's just music. Because what that does is, hey, there's 100 kids in the band and that's 100 kids. There's 100 more in the choir and there's a hundred more in the orchestra, and then there's a hundred more in the drama, and then the 50 on the step team, and then the dance team that's out there, and don't forget about the creative writers who are gonna come in and write songs and lyrics to things, and now all of a sudden, you're talking about half the school population. And so when you bring that story and the energy of that story to the principal or to the superintendent, how can you deny 50% of the school what our needs might be? We've even started listing them as music department needs, right? And so it might be marimba, and then risers, <laughs> and then <laughs> uniforms, right? And whatever those teachers decided together as they tore down, instead of getting beat over the head time after time after time again with requests, we put that into play, and then over the next three years, you're gonna get all of that stuff. And it's really been amazing to watch my teachers collaborate to do that and allow those silos to come down, allow the collective impact to really, really work strong because we are arts people, right? Um, we are arts community. We are people of creativity. And if, heck, if we can't get it done creatively, nobody's getting it done. Right. So yeah. we can do that. So anyway, it's just been a great fun thing to watch. And, it, and this was a grassroots operation. I've had an opportunity to work with some great people, you know, throughout my career. And collaboration has always been important. So collaborating with your peers in the fine arts education realm is very important. Uh, Ms. Chain, Dr. Cheney Cherry right here and I worked together just down the hall from each other, orchestra director. I was the band director. We tried as hard as we could to do as many concerts together as possible, including the choir director, including we even brought on a dance person and a visual arts person. We'll do an art gallery right outside the concert where parents can see what's going on with the visual arts students. But it's a grassroots thing. You know, your students have to be involved. The I-65 uh, project teachers, you found out this weekend that involving your students in every aspect of what you do, you know, will make a difference. I, I'd like to hear from one of you all about what you've learned differently about collaborating with your students this, this weekend. Anybody? All right. I'm John Hagen, Frisbee Addicts High School in Indianapolis, and I'm starting there in August. Uh, so it's, there is an incredible sense of urgency and importance to collaborating with my students because a lot of them have been at the school longer than I have. So they're going to help me define what that school program is going to look like and what it's going to mean for what it has meant for them and what it's going to mean for all the other students that are coming from other schools because there's lots of shuffling going around at all of our four schools as we go from seven campuses down to four. So it's really important that I get the students involved because right now they are the banner carriers for what that music program looks like and there's a lot for me to learn from them as well as contribute to making it something new it was very very touching to meet the students from from the um, from the i-65 initiative and to hear them passionately talk about their programs even the one that that he that he's starting in in the fall they still were talking about experiences that they had before and and what they all had was a passion for band for band and 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 music and and we give that that to them in everything that we do um, you know, I hope that everyone one in here, if this is your, your first time coming to the sym symposium, do bring, a, if, if you can just bring one, you, and, you and, and that one student to come and have the experience of them meeting other people who share that same passion and show all of those, those great and wonderful things that they can bring back to their, to their program. Whatever it may, whatever it may be, it's, it's a life-changing experience. These, the students that are here now, they'll never be the same. This is a, a total positive situation. And I know I have learned from them.
these uh, directors in here have, have learned from them and, and the experience. Everything that you want to do with your program is going ha to happen, but you have to remember to keep in introducing new experiences to your students. And the students I talk to, um, they're here mainly for the students that are not here. And it was just amazing to hear how much they want to absorb so they can take back to their schools. And their long-term goals were making their band better. And it was almost forceful to say, hey, have you thought about yourself in this? Oh, well, and then they had some individual things they wanted to work on. But the overall scope of all the kids that were in here, the main line was that they wanted to help. There was one kid that said, hey, I want to be better so I could help my section. I want my section to be better, and that's why I'm here. And it wasn't anything about him. It wasn't that I wanted to be the greatest player and I want to be recognized. No, it was about everyone else but him. And that was probably one of the most beautiful statements that you can get from a kid, that he, is, he or she is willing to work for the whole rather than one. <laughs> okay. um, there's an idea that I didn't come up with, but something that we do at our school every year that we've done for the last several years, um, speaking on the collaboration point, we have a fine arts festival every year during the school day. I know a lot of times we do a lot of things after school and you have to get the community to come. Um, but what about the actual students at your school? Do they really get to see your bands or orchestras perform um, other than a football game if they come to the football game? Um, so we started a fine arts festival and it's during the school day. We're on a seven period day, but that day we're on a block schedule. And so we have two performing blocks in the morning, two performing blocks in the evening, and then the lunch block where no one, no one performs. Um, when we first started doing this, the very first block would be an invited ensemble. So we would have a, uh, like a university still pan group come or something that we know that the kids aren't gonna see <laughs> anywhere else. Um, we had Atlanta Symphony Orchestra String Quartet come one year. Um, all of that's outreach. They don't get paid for that. So there's someone in your community somewhere who will come um, and expose your students to, uh, to things that they may or may not go and see on their own. And then for the other three performing blocks, band and orchestra would share one. Um, each block was about an hour, so each one of us did about 20, 25 minutes worth of stuff, whatever we wanted to do. Drama would have a block, and they would do... Um, skits or monologues and things like that and then the chorus would have a block um, and they got their own block because uh, it was they were trying to publicize a variety show that they do every year so they had several different things it's kind of morphed into where band has its own block now orchestra has its own block and we just haven't invited people the art um, teacher is involved uh, with an art show that you just mentioned out in the lobby and then we also would invite a professional artist to come and create a work right there in front of the kids so as the kids were playing they would be over to the side and the students you know art students of course, you know, hey, they want to sit right there in the front so they can see this artist create this work. And then the art department would um, benefit from it because they got to auction the, the piece of work, the piece of the art, artwork, <laughs> and make money for the art department. So uh, it didn't charge the kids anything. Uh, the, the auditorium that we have now um, seats only about 800 students. So the teachers would have to sign up to come and you will be surprised at how quickly those 800 seats because the teachers want a day off <laughs> with their kids because they know that their schedule is going to be messed up messed up you know anyway because they're on block they're not seeing all seven or six classes 
um, anyway, so they want to take their kids. Um, the math department, as fine arts chair, the math department always contacts me and says, when are you sending out the email? All of the math teachers are going <laughs> to sign up for the block first. And so I may say, hey, check your email, send her a text or something, and then all of a sudden you'll see all the math classes signed up for the fine arts department, so uh, for the fine arts festival. So it works for us. Um, it's because we have an administration who's willing to give up a day. We normally do it the Thursday before Thanksgiving when things are kind of winding down anyway um, for those particular classes. So that's just an idea that helps at least um, publicize your program t within your school. And it goes back to collaboration with the teachers too because they get to see their students in a different light. Wow. Anybody getting any good ideas here today? <laughs> So, you know, limited resources often uh, force us to think outside the box. The, the perfect examples here. What about, you know, uh, being creative uh, and inventive when it comes to repertoire or, or designing a show, whether it be marching band or, or show choir? We already, got it. Oh, we already yeah. Uh, um, I'm an orchestra director, a high school orchestra director, and uh, something that I did this past fall, which interacted with all of the arts departments in my school is my show was called Anarchy and Art Key and it was basically talking about some of the deficiencies that we're struggling with in Atlanta um, is um, lack of programming in some of our elementary and feeder programs so uh, for example I've had four different directors in five years in my middle school program so, in other words, I'm not being fed the talent that I was once fed. So, like this year, I've got three new students in my program. So, um, we have some problems, and so with that, I created a show, and my show is called Anarchy, and it was basically, I wrote a script about what, I do a Halloween show every year, and it was basically, what would the future look like without the arts? So, the school was like a, like a ghost town, and so it was like a child woke up, and she was like walking through and we had everything, the whole auditorium was, was decorated like, like a ghost town. And so they came in and was like, well, what is going on? And they met the ghost of fine arts past. <laughs> and they met, <laughs> I'm serious, they met, um, they met the, the, evil, the evil ghost, I can't remember what his name was, but he was the one that got rid of the arts. And, they, uh, and then the drummers for change were the ones that came at the end, which of course was the drum line. And they came and, and everything, and then the person who was the evil, which was actually one of our literature teachers, who's also um, a spoken word artist and rapper. So he wrote an entire show around his character. And at the end, the drummers for changed caused him to change back into a person who was in support of the arts. And one of the drummers gives him a triangle and he walks out with them like he's now a drummer for change. But, <laughs> you know, but um, it was a full show and we had an art exhibit, an art exhibit. All of my arts teachers were in the show. So um, one of the, the art teacher, she had an all white, white face like she was a ghost. And she spoke about how um, she didn't have the supplies that she needed and she had to spend so much of her own money and they ended up um, and you know she she ended up freezing like she's a frozen like a statue so that was her character like she was became a statue and um, so I mean like I said it was kind of a roundabout way for me to try to get the attention of my uh, my administrators I, my district staff and I think it caught their attention so um, it was kind of like I said a roundabout way to let them know that we have some deficiencies in the arts in this area do you want to wake up in five years and the arts are gone so more or less story the end of the show the girl wakes up and it's like on the screen and it was a dream so she was like the arts is still here and they're like yeah what are you talking about you know dr such is down there or mrs such such down there so it was a it was like a nightmare for her but um it was kind of a wake-up call not just for our administrators but for our community they need to know what's going on and that it, it really is a fear that we may not have these you know these programs in a few years so It's sort of like Nightmare on Music Street, huh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah.
one of the words that kept coming up there was was change. You know, adaptation to change. Uh, you know, adapting to change is one of uh, the fundamental you know human traits uh, in our profession. Uh, you know, we see change all the time. Whether it's you know different jobs. Uh, you know administrators coming in, uh, sometimes the uh, demographics changes. Uh, Sybil, I know you've been teaching multiple schools, three different states. Uh, can you talk to us a little bit about just that, that adaptation to change? Um, really, you know, if you haven't already developed a vision for, for what you believe and, and what your philosophy is for music education, that's, that's step number one. And you have to have, have that ready and it has to be known to all those people that are, that are around you and you have to convey that to your students and to the community and to everyone in your building. And as I said earlier, you have to be able to give them a snapshot of that as many times as you can and to, to give that passion for, for what you're trying to do. Um, for the school that, that I'm work, working at right now, when I was hired seven years ago, I was the only band director. They had a different superintendent. Um, I was by myself for two years. There was, no, there was no staff. My budget was very, very small. You know, I know what it is not to have one. I've worked places where I didn't have a budget. I was blessed to have a little bit of money. I thought I had something <laughs> when I was there. But uh, then as I was get, introducing my, my vision to, uh, to other people, we had turnover of administrators. Also, like I said, the, the community that my school serves, kids are in and out all the time. You know, you have different fam families coming in and out all the time and you keep having, having to do that and that's still, still going on to this day. But we wound up with a great superintendent who, who is fine arts oriented and I had a great fine arts supervisor who, who was a great advocate for me and I made sure that he knew, you know, I, I, I kept in constant contact with him to let him know what my vision was for this program. And, and the thing, thing is, the program where I teach is like the program that I came, and came out of. That neighborhood is like the neighborhood that I grew up in. The school that I went to is like the school, school that like the school where I teach. So it was very easy for for me to ab advocate for my students. And throughout any trans transition, whatever it may be, it, it may be change of administration. It may be a tragedy like a flood. For us, we had we had a mold infestation problem that took us off of our campus, and we lo lost some of these things that our, our superintendent blessed us with if you continue to have to have that vision and you continue to share it with those people those people who can help you you're going to be able to meet the goals that that you have set um, you know the demographic of that school school was different um, you know 20 years ago that community was predominantly african-american now it's 60 percent hispanic so you also have to be be able to also keep those those goals but also understand that the people that you that you're you're serving are, are going to change and you have to be willing to still keep those goals but 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 tweak those goals so that so that it would be appropriate for for the situation that you're in at that time you know don't get caught up in in, in com competing with the people around you you got got to share those ideas and help each other out you know because just you may be in a great situation right now but it could change tomorrow we're in music education you know they they cut this this stuff every day you know <laughs> and and you may have to start all the way back over you know i may not get another penny next year you know this may be it for me so i still have in the back of my mind okay how am i going to get what they what, what they need and who do i have to talk to and 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 that's how you, how you deal with change you just keep going and you keep you let that passion drive you to get the get the best things that you can for your students and even after all the adversity you go through through change even the logistical issues that you've overcome with your administration you still have to put on a educational entertaining positive show yes. Uh, how do you get to that point when we just covered all of that? So now, oh man, I have to plan a show. Either it be on the stage or on the field. I have to bring all these forces together to make this seven or eight and a half minute show work. And after I did all of that, so when they say teachers don't get paid, uh, they, they have a summer off. I never saw that, but... Um, 
But when you come back and you have to also teach these kids to be the greatest performers that they can be and doing it without carrying the weight of change. Uh, you, you, you graduated your, 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 your first four trumpet players and now you have replacing them with ninth graders. How do you still put on a show, a high quality show that is entertaining and also educational? Because the first thing is education. And, and there's, uh, you can be educational and entertaining at the same time. Just like what you did with your orchestra, I think that is amazing that someone would do an orchestra show. Uh, I know when you sit in a room and you say, okay, well, the orchestra is playing, uh, some may think they're going to hear Tchaikovsky or something to that effect. But if you do, you could dress it up just like you did. So being creative and being amazing with your thought process alongside doing all the administrative work you have to do, you have to keep in mind that these kids, that you have to make them amazing every performance. Well, we, we talked about some things earlier to where those kids are going to to pick that up from you, wanting to be amazing, performing at a high, high rate, by, by you leading by example. You know, when we were in school, you know, we used to hear all the things about modeling in your class. Make sure you model this and the other. I encourage the, the, the teachers in the I-65 Corridor Summit to keep in mind that you have to be a, a teacher artist. We have to continue to perform. We have to show our students that this is a lifelong learning situation. They need to see that we're uh, rehearsing, that we're practicing, that we're woodshedding. You know, one of our, our teachers talked about the fact that, I think it was Mr. Beck, that said that uh, he would now post his, uh, his weekly uh, practice. practice log. Mm -hmm. And that we pass them out to our kids, but for his kids to see that his practice log is posted on the wall, they know that he's an artist as well. We had to teach artistry from the beginning. Mm -hmm. If we wait down the line to talk about being an artist in, in, in music, you've lost, this, you've created a, a monster that's gonna be hard to, you know, to, 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 to rein in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can't control it. Teach artistry from the beginning, from that very first note on the first page of that book. Teach how to approach it, how to play through it, how to involve emotion, how to, em emotions and how to do different things with it. Passion is going to start there. Passion is going to take you other places. I know, Mr. Stinson, we talked the other day about how passionate you are in your area where you have so many different socioeconomic situations going on where you, you have the affluent side, but you don't want to leave those who don't have behind. So you have to be creative. And so don't, don't lose that passion to be creative with those students who don't quite have and, and be aggressive, like you said earlier, to go and find those things that are going to get us over. I, I believe as... as, as um Arts, arts educators too, we do have a responsibility to teach appreciation for all arts. On some campuses in, in, in our country, there may be one fine art activity, you know, and you still, that's a big responsibility, but you still have to make sure kids know about visual, visual art. If there is no orchestra, they should know what a cello is just by looking at it if all they have on their campus is a band program. They should know about opera and choir and, and all of the facets of the arts. It's a huge responsibility, but as, as arts educators, we have that responsib responsibility. Music is, is our thing, but we all fit together. In the, in the fight between kids deciding how to spend their time. And I know I keep talking this like it's a lot of business, but uh, I think you've got two main marketplace factors. And we've talked about the battle between entertainment and education, and it can seem sometimes that you have to cater to one over the other for certain kinds of support. But kids will come to your program and stay in your program for two market factors, two reasons. One, you care about them. And you, for some time, you're going to have kids in your class where you're the only one in their life that does. A kid will work so hard for you when they feel in their heart that you're the person who cares. The second is kids want to be a part of something good. If they are proud of it and they think it's excellent and it is excellent and you define what excellent is, but when, they're, when they think they're a part of something really special, led by someone who really cares about them, you got them. And then that'll spread. 
The kids on your campus want to be a part of the best thing on the campus. Um, and so sometimes when we feel the need to, should we play, I don't know any cool hip new music, so um, should we play Tchaikovsky or you know something pop? Well, if, if it's really good, I don't think they're gonna care which it is so long as they take a lot of pride in it. Uh, and I, I think that that's an important thing for us to remember. Sometimes we think that high standards may drive kids off. And I've always been surprised to find the higher I put the standards, the more kids wanted to do it because they wanted someone in their life to finally tell them, oh, you think I got this? Okay, let's do it. And that's powerful. So we've heard lots of different uh, ideas today and, and, the, and the panel has thrown out lots of different suggestions. Are there any questions that you all have for any of our panelists today on, on specifics or any other additional thoughts? Yes, sir. Just recruitment, recruitment for the kid who want to play but never come to you. Because see, I think that's the problem in most of the schools. It, it's not the kids that are in the program that we have to convince or the people that support the program is the folks who are not in the program. Yeah. How do we find and recruit those others? Well, I'll tell you, there was something amazing. Uh, one year, um, we were looking to fill out uh, uh, our melodic line, uh, vibraphone and marimba specifically. And uh, I, I got a thought one day, I said, I know there are some piano players in this school. They're not in band, they're not in choir, but they've taken piano lessons. And so during lunch period, I very popular with a lot of kids when I was teaching, and I would just ask questions, hey, they play piano, or do you know someone who plays piano? And in five minutes, they'll go scour. They would get kids out of class and bring them in. And, <laughs> and <laughs> yeah, I play piano. I've been playing since I was five or I was three. And in high school, oh, we need to see you. So they'll come to the band hall, and uh, I'll show them the instrument. And I said, it, it, it's, they'll kind of look at it and like, you know, fingers, what do you want me to do with this? And then I'll show them mallets, and I'm saying, well, it's basically, these mallets here are an extension of your fingers, of your hands. And, and before long, I'll get them to come by, and they'll play on it in the morning, and some of them start playing some stuff that they know to play on piano with two. And I get them really acclimated to two. And then also I add two more. And it was like, oh, I can't do that. But before long, they can. So now we had five piano players that would never thought about being in band in band. So ask. And, and get, your, get your, your band students to go out and, and recruit, like what uh, Ayate was saying get them to go out. They know some students that probably want to be in band. They missed it their first year of starting band because they may have been doing football or something like that. And now they're not doing football anymore because they got hurt or mama got afraid and said, well, you're not playing football anymore. But they're afraid to ask. So, so let your students be your recruiting tool uh, to help in, within, the, within the school. I think you just need to be open. Um, I think one of the things that we, we see a challenge all the time is there, there are some programs where they say, look, if you didn't start in sixth grade, that's your one point of entry, and then it's a war of attrition from there on out. Um, and then other programs where they'll say, uh, you know, you can start at any point. I think choir is a great example of this. Oftentimes you can be a senior and take choir one. Um, you can be an, a senior in high school and take your first art class if you want. And yet oftentimes in instrumental music, we have a real tendency to say if you didn't you didn't happen to be on that one day where we tried kids out to see what their arm length was and whether they were going to play violin or cello, then you are henceforth expelled from the, from the group. Um, now the other thing is, so if you make it clear that there is an entry opportunity, and obviously you need to do that carefully because you do want as many kids to do it as sixth grade as possible, but you make clear that it is, you also have to support it. This is where I've seen a lot of um, challenges happen, where people will say, okay, fine, we'll let, a, we'll let an 11th grader join band. But well, we don't have a beginner band class. So you're going to throw them into whatever period they are and they get thrown into the varsity class and then that kid hates it and they want to quit five minutes later. So you also have to have a pathway for that student. If you're going to allow kids in because you need them on the field, you also got to support them in the spring with some kind of beginning band curriculum to get them rolling. Um, and you know, be thinking, maybe you only have, 
Maybe it's only trumpet, flute, and trombone or something that a kid can start after a certain point, and you have extra ones of those around to support them to provide the instrument. But think all the way through the logistics. Let's talk about the long game. Um, think all the way through the logistics of so five years from now, how will you support that program decision? Also, think about um, uh, peer teaching. If you got a kid that hasn't been in band and you got your, your students recruiting, let that student know that, hey, you may have to be this private instructor for, for, for this student. And most of the time, if they're friends or they, or, or they really like each other, they'll take, that, they'll, they'll, they'll take that challenge. So just to piggyback more a little bit on that, when I was um, at the high school, we were trying to grow and we were needing French horns really bad. And we knew that there had been some in the middle school program who, for some reason, didn't continue on in the high school. So we just did something as simple as sending out a morning announcement. Hey, if you were in the middle school band, and especially if you played French horn, you know, if you want to come to the band room, we would love to talk to you. We had four show up. It was amazing, and now that I'm at a middle school program, and it was it was hurting in numbers, and we just put a morning announcement out there. Hey, if you didn't get to start beginning band, but it doesn't matter what grade you're in, if you want to come to the band, you know, come see us. Had about again, I think I had six show up, and I would just stay after school with them. You know, it didn't take that much of my time to stay an extra hour each day, but those kids have continued on in the high school program, and one of them section leader. You know, it's just it's fantastic that they wanted to be in it. We just asked. And then just that little bit of time went a long way. So. Well, actually, I did something like that with a student that was in the 10th grade. Uh, he played the guitar, uh, but he read tab, didn't really, didn't read music at all. Um, but again, you know, hang, hanging out at lunch duty. Um, hey, why don't you stop by and, you know, think about, you know, joining the band. Well, he didn't think about joining the band right away, but... The band hall was enticing. I don't know why kids gravitate to the band hall, even though they wasn't band students. And so I um, asked him about playing tuba. He was looking at him, fascinated. I said, go ahead and pick it up. You know, I went and got him my piece, and I'm a germaphobe, anybody who knows me. <laughs> so <laughs> I made sure he had a new mouthpiece. And I said, well, you're going to have to play it now that you played on it, because nobody's going to play on it again. So um, he accepted that <laughs> challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Never underestimate the power of coercion. <laughs> I'm trying to keep mine short. I got three similar things. Um, one of the high schools I was at, I'm in Huntsville, Alabama. Um, I was at Butler High School, which has recently closed down after being open for a really long time. Um, so the middle school feeder had fallen off a great deal. So, of course, that filters up. So the high school program was barely existent. So much where the faculty would say, we don't have a band. Yeah, we do. It's, it's small, but yeah, we have a band. So my first year there, it was basically just the drum line. So a few directors prior to me got a drum line going, and they were really, really good to where if there was five of them, all five knew the snare part, all five knew the tenor part, all five knew the drum part, all five knew the cymbal part, but the flashes and the dances. So they could all switch at any time. But when I got there, there was a problem because one day someone's on snare, and then the next day someone's on, well, I thought you were on snare yesterday. Yeah, I'm tired of that. So trying to, <laughs> just trying to get them to be consistent. But um, they weren't really too into the concert band reading side, so that trying to expose them to that was a, interesting challenge but the next year I had a guitar player show up electric guitar I said well um we can make this work I'm just not quite sure yet um of course he was self-taught so you read tab sheets I'm like okay well well this should be this note so no this is C oh, he played in drop C or what, something like that so I was like okay that's completely different I said well how about this you played the bass line on the two strings because he didn't know how to play but she played lead and I got a amp and went to Walmart or Home Depot and got an electrical um, generator. So I charge it up, take it to the game. So I, I had a baseline. And, and then to help him do what he wanted to do later in the spring, we did some stuff. I said, OK, you can play. Here's some chords. So on how to play chord changes and how to read um, a different type of you know, jazz um, music notation as far as chord changes. Then I said, okay, I don't need distortion on this song. I said, oh, come on. I said, no, next song, okay, a little bit, but not. But so that worked out as far as just making a, the situation work. Um, when I got to my high school, I'm currently in my first year, they just kind of threw kids into a beginning band class. And I didn't really have 
I want to use all my instruments for my advanced band because my inventory was limited. I had about eight or nine. You know, those eight or nine, really, I kept two that will be seniors this year. So the, the turnover, the return, is kind of not, I want to say not worth the, okay, I'm going to give up these 10 instruments for people who have never played before, but I have 10 other students that have played before that come in from the middle school. I don't, you know, that, that's a tricky, tricky game to play. Um, but one of those two is doing really, really well. The other one is a percussionist, and well, he's a percussionist. Um, but keeping around for the moment, but he's doing well. But it's just tricky. So my question would be, how do you navigate and balance? Well, if you have limited inventory, you, of course, want to outfit the students that you're going to see during band camp. So they're there already. So they got the tuba and the trumpet and the clarinet checked out. Now you're out of instruments, and then you have four or five. I want to play drums. Well, I don't have any more drums, sticks, mallets, bell kits available or any more trumpets to, well, I don't have any of that work. They're not in a position to go out and rent any. So, well, you can go to this store, it's only this much a month. Um, so how do we navigate that? Like all the borrowing from the feeder schools has been exhausted. Asking for the community support is kind of exhausted. exhausted. So what are some other ways to kind of navigate that? that keeps your people from, okay, you play for 10 minutes and then pass it over, you play for 10 minutes. <laughs> uh, Mr. Holland's Opus still have a, a program that, uh, that gives grants uh, instruments. They actually, and um, um, I was at a uh, private school and, uh, in 07, we had that issue. And uh, they donated uh, about 12 instruments to the school. You just have to do a lot of internet searching and, and research and writing and, and, and like she said, you know, really spell out why you need what you need. I mean, it, it, it can be some tear jerking stories, which, is, which are true if you really think about it. A kid without an instrument that really wants to play, that's really sad. This may not be useful to you, um, but here's what what I have done um, where I work. It is a requirement that a student have an, is an instrument issued to them or have one at their own disposal in order to be enrolled in, um, in a class that requires an instrument. So that is, a, that is in the course guidelines. Um, and essentially what we say is, if we run out of instruments, you've just capped the enrollment. That helps in a lot of ways. One, we don't support, uh, while I don't have a problem with doubling, um, we do believe very much you need to invest in one instrument and then kind of go on from there and that's part of the curriculum the way it's been designed. If you can get that on, from on high from your curriculum people to say, yes, this is a responsibility and this is a requirement and you have to have it, then a principal will start to understand well, what do you, I can't throw that extra 30 kids in that beginning band class. I don't understand. That's really helping with my master schedule. And we go, well, we'd love to take those 30 kids in, but unfortunately, it's a requirement that the kids have an instrument we don't have anymore. Um, and I just happen to have a quote here for 30 instruments that I got from the music store, and there are district-approved vendors, and you could actually solve this problem today. And that, I mean, that's what we are talking about earlier, making it easier on the people that decide. But if you can have that on the back end, it makes you not the bad guy. It makes the principal not even the bad guy. It just comes down to, well, we wouldn't put these kids in class without lab equipment, so we're not going to put them in band class without an instrument. So that's, that's how we deal with it. The conversation today has been fantastic, and unfortunately we're, we're out of time, but I, I certainly want to thank our panelists for, for sharing your expertise with us today, and certainly everybody who's with us, uh, the active participation has been fantastic. Uh, again, thank you for choosing to be a part of the Music for All Summer Symposium, and uh, thank you for your participation today in uh, the Music for All uh, Urban Education Environment. Uh, summit. So uh, again, thank you, and we hope that you enjoy the rest of the uh, Music for All Summer Symposium presented by Yamaha. Thank you.